This week's classic episode is uh, is of particular importance to us and arguably the world on November 29th, 2023. America's Darth Vader, Henry Kissinger, passed away. It's true. And I mean, I think it's kind of been an ongoing joke simply because the guy seemed like his blood was flowing with Sith Lord energy and that he was never going to die. So Ben quite often gauged like time against is Kissinger still with us. Mm -hmm. And then we literally made that joke, I think, the day that he passed away. And I think I was like, we did this. This was us. Yeah, but, I don't think we had anything no, to do no, with we it. Didn't. The no, man we was a hundred years old. Crazy. We were literally waiting on the clock uh, with him. Yeah, and it is strange to, I, if you look at the reporting that's come out anywhere in mainstream, it's always Henry Kissinger, like this very important figure, mm-hmm. right in in the world, mm-hmm. who also. Did a lot of bad things. We're going to list a lot of those things mm-hmm. out in this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Only up to 2019, right? right. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we recorded the episode. Now, I, do, I didn't mention it on this episode, but as you guys know, I had a different life before podcasting. And as a result of that, I actually saw Henry Kissinger speak in 08 we t- uh, when he was up at Athens, Georgia at UGA. Very, <laughs> very intelligent man, which we also point out in this episode. But being intelligent does not necessarily make you a good person. Yeah. And this is when you were a paper boy, right? This is when I was a paper boy. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was funny, too. We talked about even, it came up in the a, or the um, life extension episode, mm-hmm. or at the very least, the sort of, um, I guess, grief technology episode, where it's like, what if someone figured out how to make an AI synthetic version of Henry Kissinger's brain mm-hmm. and use that to consult on, like, war tactics? No, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I then, mean, he'd have some interesting thoughts. Some hot takes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they... You know, uh, the technology would probably arrive at conclusions that would be close to that of uh, Kissinger Prime. But this this person is incredibly important to the state of the world as we understand it today. He is responsible is responsible in one way or another for millions of deaths, right? And decisions that went that turned into actions, right? Or at least right. he was a voice in a room. A bunch of times that advised, whispered, that, yeah, that that ended up killing millions of people. And you gotta wonder if a guy like that even uh, makes that connection. Like I did this, you know, I killed these people, or is it just more of a matter of it's just the cost of doing business? And I certainly didn't directly do anything. It's sort of the gun versus the person shooting kind of argument, you know. Mm-hmm. He's a he's a big proponent of the greater good. Uh, by far one of the most influential secretaries of state in U.S. history to the point where he may have been steering the ship the way that typically a U.S. president or Congress would have. Or a Dick Cheney. Or a Dick Cheney, right? Um, You know, what if there was some kind of new American century? What if we made that a project? Uh Uh-oh. Or maybe something in 2025. Anyhow. Oh, God. (laughs) Anyhow, Kissinger did not live to see this stuff. Um, you, if you are interested in learning much more about Kissinger as well, after our episode, please check out the six part series from our friends at behind the bastards on Kissinger. As you could tell from the title, they may have a little bit of bias, but we went into this objectively. And so what you are hearing in this episode from 2019 is factual and terrifying. Yeah. Let's jump in. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Noel is not here. But we'll be returning soon. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deckett. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, this We've been doing this check-in at the beginning of the show. We uh, hope that you check in as well when you before you dive into the strange, bizarre, and sometimes terrifying things we explore here. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, Matt? Yeah. Good? Yes. Thumbs up, thumbs down? Uh, two thumbs up. You, ju- I- you just released a show. 
Oh yeah, I did. Yes, uh, I didn't. I assisted in the production slash creation of a show called Noble Blood mm-hmm. that is now available. It's number three on the charts right now on iTunes. Congratulations! Yeah, it's all. It's uh, Aaron Mankey and Dana Schwartz. It's and Trevor Young. Congratulations, uh, Paul. How you doing out there? Got a thumbs up. Thumbs up at a stylish angle right. from Mission Control. I, I want to bring this up before we get too deep into this. I just finished Mr. Robot Season 3, finally. Uh-huh. And, you know, we have a bit of a history with that show. We did a couple mm-hmm. of episodes surrounding Season 2, I believe. Yeah. Um, and we have masks we from do. the show. I have one sitting in my room, and when I watch the show, I always put it on, uh, which is, I don't know. Is that too weird? No, that's awesome. That's great. Okay, cool. <laughs> I just had to bring that up. I was just excited that the next one is supposedly coming out this year. Yes, I had heard. I had heard. No, uh, they'll still have Rami Malik. I imagine. I certainly hope so. And what we're going to talk about may be a sensitive subject to some people who find themselves politically partisan, right? At least in the in the Western sense. And we want to hear your opinion. So as always, if there's something that you want to tell us and you're not near a keyboard at the moment, just pause this episode. We'll wait for you and call us directly. Yes. Uh, call our number. It is 1-833-STDWYTK. What I love about this conversation with Mr. Robot is that it, we're we're kind of foreshadowing something that'll come into play later, right? Yeah, without fully saying it. Right, right. And there's there's a character within yeah. the the universe. Well, there are a couple, but there's one in particular in the universe of Mr. Robot that I find mm-hmm. that maybe you will too uh, has some similarities to our guest of honor, <laughs> our, <laughs> our, guest our, of per- our person of interest. There we go. There we go. Our POI today. Miss Robot concerns shadowy forces working in secret, conspiring, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, The power behind the throne. And it's often said in fiction and nonfiction alike that the true power of a nation, a kingdom, or an empire isn't usually the face. It's often not the person on the throne. It's the people behind that person, the folks you see standing silently behind a king, a prime minister, or a president as they deliver a speech they probably did not write. Today's episode is about one such character, one of the most influential people in the history of modern U.S. politics, Henry Kissinger. So let's go to the beginning. Henry Kissinger was born Heinz Alfred Kissinger on May 27th, 1923 in a place called Firth, Germany. He was one of two sons born uh, to Paula Stern Kissinger and Louis Kissinger. Now, his father was a teacher and, uh, you know, there was this group of people that came to power called the Nazis. And when that occurred, he lost his job and his entire career. You know, the Nazis, of course, were carrying out the orders of uh, Mr. Adolf Hitler. Um, And they, of course, began prosecuting Jewish people throughout Germany and countries all surrounding Germany. And uh, the Kissingers were, in fact, Jewish. And their family, uh, I guess the larger family, saw, saw the effects of this firsthand. Now, of course, uh, Henry was just a little boy at the time, and he's, he seemed to be a better student, at least uh, to his parents and to the people around him. They know he's a better student than perhaps an athlete or, you know, someone who is going to pursue some kind of physical career. And, you know, as the, the anti-Semitism was increasing there in Germany where they were living, the whole family decided – we have to get out of here. And in 1938, they ended up going to England. And then not long after that, they ended up going to the United States. Which was a prescient move for any student of history. The family, once they reached the U.S., they ended up settling in New York City, which you may remember from several Salsa commercials. Kissinger completed high school there and began taking night classes at City College with the intention of becoming an accountant, a CPA, Oh. On what small things does history hinge? You know what I mean? It could have gone a very different way. Can you imagine him as a CPA? We'll see. I want to hear what you think about that, folks. Yeah. (laughs) So he worked his way through college. He went to a factory during the day, and then he would go to class. During World War II, he joined the military and served in Germany. He was working in army intelligence. It is a bit odd, right? Because he's from Germany, but he went to the United States, and now he's going back to Germany to fight for the Americans or with, you know, as an American. Well, that 
That is, uh, uh, you know, it seems counterintuitive, but it happens a lot. So I've got a couple of friends whose families were originally from Iran and wow. they live in the U.S., but because they spoke Farsi, they got jobs as translators. And yeah, they ended up, you know, going back to the Middle East, I'm assuming. Uh, I believe that they are U.S. based, but I can't. Oh, understood. I can't. Just tra- yeah, no, of course we can't say anymore. <laughs> right. Understand, understand that. Well, and this is a, it's a big deal here. So even even though he was very young at the time when his family left, or you know, somewhat young, when when the family left Germany, he still experienced what was occurring in his home country, and then to leave and then get to go back. And serve in the military for a country that's going to essentially attempt to liberate the country from which you fled. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal. Oh, the biggest. Are you kidding? Yes. He also, this is something you and I mentioned off air, Matt, he also didn't sit idly by during his time in the service, right? He actually saw combat. Yeah, he, he got to experience the Battle of the Bulge firsthand. And if you don't know much about that, we won't go into it, but I would say look it up. Uh, it's uh, It was a German offensive that occurred in the West, and history describes it as, quote, the deadliest and most desperate battle of the war in the West. It involved three armies, three German armies that essentially were, were attacking over the course of uh, quite a while. And again, there's – his historian, his biographer – um, Ferguson, uh, Niall Ferguson, I believe is his name. Mm-hmm. He describes it as Henry Kissinger experienced heavy shelling firsthand. And again, these are, these are big experiences for a, um, a growing person, you know, someone who's coming into their own, having this kind of thing occur to them. And that's not all that happened during the war. Right. He also had the stark and terrifying, heartbreaking revelation that all of his family members that stayed in Germany were dead. He witnessed the horrors of the Holocaust. He was present during the liberation of a concentration camp. And following the war, he remained in Europe as an instructor at a place called the European Command Intelligence School, also in Germany. And then in 1947, he returns to the U.S., he goes to Harvard and enrolls there, and he graduated in the class of 1950, and he had a degree in government. Uh, Pretty interesting stuff there, right? So he's changing course quite a bit from those original aspirations of becoming an accountant, Mm -hmm. Um, again, with these experiences that are changing him. He, uh, He continued his studies as a graduate student and ended up earning a master's degree in 1952, and then eventually his PhD in 54. And he was also teaching at the, the Harvard University. And here's here's an important note. So we always have to be very careful when attempting to ascribe personal motives to uh, to an individual. And we we know that something happened, something fundamentally changed his life during his experiences in World War II. He became someone with a mission. We, like uh, the historians we research, have conjectured here on what what his revelatory moments were. And those are pretty good guesses. But regardless of what specific instance it was, that was the big change. Post-war, he is no longer interested in accounting or perhaps, if we want to wax a bit poetic, he is concerned with a different sort of accounting. Oh, yes. He is concerned with what he sees as moral accounting, right? Preventing, oddly enough, uh, the the horrors of World War II, fighting for what he – and he's alive today – fighting for what he would see as a greater good. And this brings him to his career in academia, right? So as you mentioned, he earned his PhD in 1954. Between 1952 and 1969, he directed the Harvard International Seminar. This was a study organization 
in which the advanced students, along with a professor, conduct research and contribute to discussions. It's sort of a nascent think tank, which happens yeah. a lot in grad schools. And in this kind of environment and position lets him start making relationships that he would eventually use later on in his career. Right, right. And, and it may surprise some of us to learn just how much policy here in the United States is written by professors in academic roles. You know, it starts with proposals, it starts with research, right, and studies, uh, or it starts with something like ALEC, wherein <laughs> that's that's uh, capital A, capital L, capital E, capital C. It's a process through which corporations dictate policy, for better or worse. I'm just saying, yeah, it doesn't, because a politician is a fan of something doesn't mean they actually wrote it any more than a prime minister or president giving a speech means they actually wrote it. And ultimately, we're going to learn here that power many times and in many ways is developed through personal relationships more than a lot of other ways. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is a failure of the human species because it lessens the impact of meritocracy. But that's a whole other thing. It's a whole other bag of badgers here. The point is, for this part, this is where Kissinger gets his taste of being a power behind the throne. He's visited by tons of international figures that, as you said, Matt, he'll later deal with in a governmental capacity. He joins the Council on Foreign Relations, and he publishes something called Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy. And this gets him some bona fide, some street cred. He is now seen as a leading expert on international relations and national defense policy. And then he gets involved with the Rockefellers. Oh, yeah. He has 18 months of uh, working with this thing called the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. He actually directed it in 1956. And uh, it had it had this uh, special studies project. Okay, now just listen to this. It's a program developed to investigate possible domestic and international problems. Okay, I, I, I hear what you're saying to me. Investigate possible domestic and international problems. Then in 1957, he became a lecturer at Harvard. He's, um, you know, talking to to the students, like he's changing or, or perhaps influencing the way students are thinking. And eventually he gets promoted to a professor in 1962. And again, he's able to teach others some of the things that he's learning and the ways he's viewing the world already. Right. And also during this time, he joins other international and domestic organizations and think tanks. He's at the National Security Council, the Arms Control Disarmament Agency, and the RAND Corporation. While D dude, you just got to jump in. All the things we've mentioned thus far that he's joining up, Council on Foreign Relation mm -hmm. Relations, the RAND Corporation, mm -hmm. we've talked about a lot of these. Right. Yes, they are the source of what could plausibly be called a lot of real conspiracies, not theories. So we'll, we'll just laundry list real quick the the rest of his the 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 broad strokes of his career sure so he's working full time at Harvard from 62 to 65 in 65 he becomes a consultant to the state department he's their vietnam consultant from 65 to 1967 he visits vietnam several times most of 1968 he was working as a campaign guru for then governor nelson rockefeller who was running for the Republican nomination for the presidency. Against Richard Nixon. Yep. Yep. Against Richie Nixon himself. And despite the fact that Nixon did defeat Rockefeller, Rockefeller contacted Nixon and was like, hey, you know, we don't know exactly what they said. But it was something <laughs> along the lines of like, hey, good game, bro. By the way, uh, you, you know, you had some real hustle out there. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my boy, HK. Uh, put him on the team, get him off the bench. And that's how Kissinger ended up heading the National Security Council. Kissinger already had a plan laid out. He did not like the U.S. foreign policy toward the USSR, the Soviet Union. He thought that they had been too nice, essentially. Yeah. They had been kid gloves. They had not been consistent. And as we know, consistency is a huge deal in any international relationship. So he said, look, Let's be honest. The Soviet Union, they're the big baddies. They're our main rival. They're our main opponents. But you got to respect them. You know what I mean? That's yeah. how 
he was he was kind of the same way. He said, look, take him seriously. It's dangerous. It's a nuclear power. And one of his big early successes was the institution of detente, which is easing relationships, easing tensions, saying, look, we both know the lay of the chessboard here. We're probably never going to be friends, but we should communicate and we should do our best best not to blow up the world while we fight with our nuclear weapons. Some would say that's pretty smart. That's a good way to to look at things. Let's not blow each other up. We get it. We know who we are. <laughs> right. I, I can, I understand that. Yeah. And that's, that's a very clear cut thing, right? And it's, and it's a powerful thing. Uh, even, <laughs> even in a microcosmic level, uh, some of us may have had that occur in our personal lives. Yeah, certainly. But it is m- far more nuanced than that, right? Mm-hmm. In order like that, if that's the ideal or that's the baseline goal, mm-hmm. let's not blow each other up. We understand who we are. Underneath that is just, oh, wasps, just a swarm of wasps for oh, yeah. some reason. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so – one of the things he does is the successful agreement on something called SALT or Strategic Arms Limitations Treaty. The Soviet Union and the U.S. say, OK, we're going to limit the number of nuclear weapons we have. We're not going to get rid of them ever because we both know who we are. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, we we promise not to have millions of them because that's just egregious. And when they when they signed this agreement, he was seen as someone, again, working for the greater good and the greater good being avoiding nuclear annihilation or a nuclear war. And now you will hear people argue whether he is a hero or a villain. He used to speak about once a year here in Georgia. And I, I believe he hasn't done that for a number of years, but you could go – visit him, hear him speak at different places, and he is treated very much as an elder statesman, a policy emperor, you know, a king behind the throne. But regardless of what you might think of his work, there is no arguing that he's been anything other than massively successful in his personal life. Between January 2017 and January 2018, he pulled in an estimated $58 million. This makes him by far one of the highest paid politicians in the world, excepting, excepting you know, dictators or Putin-type figures. Yeah, people who set that number themselves essentially by the state or the, whatever the state pays them. Right. His estimated net worth is said to be $185 million, according to the publication People With Money. Some folks regard him as a hero. They say he's a man who helped secure the U.S. position as the hegemon, as the premier global superpower. Others, however, consider him an irredeemable villain. Why? We'll talk about that right after a quick word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. Again, while opinions on Kissinger may differ, over the course of his career, he has been implicated in numerous activities that could be called, at the very least, illegal. He's also been uh, the subject of numerous conspiracy theories. Let's just laundry list some of the illegal actions that he was directly involved in. Absolutely. Let's jump to 1969 and 70 in Cambodia. Now, Henry Kissinger is considered, I guess, one of the one of the main architects of the secret bombing that occurred there in Cambodia. And it this uh, this bombing itself played a really important role in bringing about the Khmer Rouge that we've discussed before mm-hmm. on this show, certainly on YouTube as well, uh, bringing them about as a power there in Cambodia as basically an unintended side effect of taking out the power that already existed in that country. Attempting to eliminate the communist threat that they saw. Yeah. And let's just go ahead and say this at the top here. Many times we've seen over the history of the United States that there is a major enemy that we will identify and attempt to eliminate or even if it's just ideological and then by militarily or through a coup eliminating that, 
there are these unintended consequences that come about because of the vacuum of power that exists in whatever that place is where some group or despot or person will come through and just grasp that power. And that's what we see happening in Cambodia in 1969-70. Yep, yep. Uh, at least 40,000 people died as a result of this. The bombing uh, itself that he was the architect of. Right. And he entered into ceasefire negotiations with North Vietnam. He was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize for this and his critics – find that ironic and reportedly even Kissinger himself was like, I don't deserve this. Yeah. Well, especially when you think about the Khmer Rouge and, and what happened afterwards because because of them, mm -hmm. millions of people were slaughtered. Yes, absolutely. Let's go to October 1969. He had this thing called Madman Theory. And Madman Theory, now with the benefit of retrospect, yeah. is weird and hilarious. It was essentially a PR branding campaign whereby Kissinger wanted to make leaders of communist nations think that Richard Nixon was insane. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, like scare like, them basically. Yeah, like, like larger in life kind of – crazy person you don't know is he going left is he going right is he launching a nuke uh it, this does is, it remind you of something <laughs> maybe uh maybe but in this case it's an act yeah uh, so <laughs> the uh, i mean in this case it is it is a calculated thing and it was of great benefit to in backdoor uh diplomatic conversations because one thing a lot of diplomats do is they say look we're like each other. We're just – we happen to be on different sides of a conversation. Just trying to do the best for the people we represent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I get it. Like I work directly with Nixon and he is nuts. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know what he's going to do. I feel like it's best for us to work this out between us and quickly before he gets – I mean, he might have a bad day. He's got that football thing that has the codes in it. It's crazy. So, yeah. So it's kind of like building rapport. Like you're, you're – as a diplomat, you're sort of distancing yourself from the policy and saying like, I'm here to help you, buddy. Uh, so, so this is effective. He has something called Operation Giant Lance. Nixon, again – Nixon yeah. sends 18 B-52 bombers with nuclear warheads to the border of the Soviet Union, the eastern border. And they're hoping that this madman theory is believable enough that the Soviet government will panic and say – and pressure its proxy, North Vietnam, to accept U.S. peace demands. And could you say this is – a brilliant psyop? Could you say it's just – it's ugly? Uh, yeah. It's a bully tactic, but bully tactics kind of par for the course in a lot of these things, especially if you're playing real politic. And, you know, and you're playing with nukes. And you're playing with nukes. That's the problem. Yeah. And then in the end, North Vietnam is victorious and, uh, you know, in the Paris peace accords mm -hmm. occur anyway. Right. So 1971, at least in the case of – I want to note, at least in the case of Giant Lance, thousands and thousands of people did not die. Yes. In 1971, he supported Pakistan as it massacred over a million people during what was called the Bangladesh Liberation War. He also joked about the massacre of Bengali Hindus and he sneered at Americans who, quote, bleed for the dying Bengalis. That's according to Professor Gary Bass, who was writing in Politico magazine about this. Bass also says that Kissinger's policy was, again, oriented toward what he saw as the greater good. Pakistan, he might say, has some imperfections, including, you know, massacring millions of people, but it's also not communist. And it's good to have that chess piece in play to to prevent the spread of communism. Now, remember, he's working closely with Richard Nixon uh, during a lot of this stuff, and he he ends up being one of the primary reasons that Nixon begins wiretapping everybody and recording everybody, and he ends up being a part of Watergate, or he's involved at least. But we can leave that for perhaps another episode. Um, you should just know that he was involved in Watergate and wiretapping. Yes, yeah. That definitely happened. He also aided uh, Indonesia under the brutal dictatorship of Suharto uh, in terms of financial aid and military funding. 
In 73, he overthrew the democratically elected Salvador Allende in Chile, installing the dictator Augusto Pinochet. Yeah, and remember, he didn't do it with his bare hands like that, but man, that guy made it happen through, uh, you know, I guess engineering is a good way to put it, Ben. He he made it occur with his <laughs> voice. Right, he puppeteered it. Perhaps. Yeah. So he also supported... Operation Condor. Operation Condor was a campaign designed to get the secret police of fascist dictators in South America to work together supporting coups on non-fascist countries and facilitating drug dealing in the region. As a way to provide funds for these kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. he, was a, he was a fan of Pinochet because he was not a communist. And he was a, also a fan of the junta in Argentina at the time. We also found, according to documents that were released in 2014, that he signaled in the 1970s to Argentina's right-wing military leaders something along the lines of, Hey, you know, dissent is just a real pill, isn't it, guys? If you need to crack down on those commies and those pinkos and those hippies, you know, we're, we don't really have a problem with that. We just want you to know we don't have a problem with it. And that became implicit support of what is called the Dirty War. The Dirty War resulted in the deaths of more than 30,000 people. And one of the craziest things about those documents that you mentioned, Ben, that were released in 2014 is that there are accounts from several people, one of whom was uh, Robert Hill, who was the ambassador to Argentina. And it's this conversation that uh, Kissinger had with a foreign minister there um, named Gazzetti. And, okay, so apparently this foreign minister was was really afraid that if they were doing this dirty war, they were going to carry this stuff out and they were going to continue doing it. They were afraid that the United States would end up cracking down on their activities and their government in general as a way of fighting against these human rights violations that were occurring, right? Right. And then Kissinger says to him, I mean, this is paraphrasing, but uh, you don't you don't need to worry about that. That's not going to happen. Right. So it is maybe a little bit hyperbolic, but it was a breakfast that resulted in the death of 30,000 people. But it wasn't really. They were going to – they were probably going to make the dirty war happen anyway. Kissinger in this case knew about it and did not stop it and gave them sort of an attaboy. Yeah. And let's go to one more example. In December of 1975, he approved the Indonesian invasion – of East Timor, resulting in 100,000 to 180 deaths, conflict-related deaths. And conflict-related death could be anything from starvation or disease related to the horrors of war. It, what we're saying is it doesn't have to be an actual, you know, gunshot to the head or death by bombing. War brings death in many forms. Let's put that in perspective. So we said 100 to 180,000 people died in conflict-related deaths. 300,000 people were forced to relocate. Maybe not the biggest number until you consider the total population of the country at the time. Yeah, only 682,000 human beings. So that's over half of the people were relocated. And add on to that the number of people who died. That's a, that's a rough move there. This tally of massive death that has been indirectly attributed to Kissinger seems – it seems like quite a tab to add up over time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And again, there are a lot of people who would say, now hold on and we'll get to them after a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Now, hold on. It's fair to say, hey, governments are big, and we need to avoid the lazy fallacy of blaming all these events on a single man. He might have had his hands tied. He might have not been aware that this was all happening at all. Right? Right. You know, it is true. Um, we, we have been pretty rough on Kissinger already, saying that he engineered all these things, basically blaming him for all these deaths. Um, it, I don't know. Maybe that really isn't all that fair. I mean, maybe. The, here's the problem, Matt. 
experts, including people who uh, applaud Kissinger's actions, disagree with the idea that he was unaware of these things. Christopher Hitchens who yes. was recognized for no- a number of other things. He's polemical. He's, uh, he was, in his time, a huge proponent of atheism and so on, right? That may be one of the ways he's best known today. Sure. I am quite hilarious in his uh, digs of other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cantankerous. Oh, yeah, and, and also uh, hated or loved, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. He had no chill. There you go. Christopher Hitchens had no chill, one way or the other. He wrote a book called The Trial of Henry Kissinger. And in this book, he says, The degree of micromanagement revealed in Kissinger's memoirs forbids the idea that anything of importance took place without his knowledge or permission. Of nothing is this more true than his own individual involvement in the bombing of neutral Cambodia. Mm. And then – so that's – that's one of the many arguments. In full disclosure, Hitchens is not a fan of Kissinger, yeah. and it's pretty it's pretty obvious in the way he writes about him. But even people who are like, you know, got to break a few eggs. That's how geopolitical omelets work. Even they are they will say that Kissinger did this. It didn't just happen when he was off on vacation on a Friday. According to a guy named Greg Grandin, who's a professor of history at New York University, this means that quote. A back-of-the-envelope count would attribute three, maybe four million deaths to Kissinger's actions, but that number probably undercounts his victims. Yikes. Yeah, that's a history uh, a history professor at New York University saying that you should probably attribute three or four million deaths to this man. And this doesn't even touch on the conspiracy theories. Oh, no. My God. Uh Again, when you are a part of all of these different organizations, when you're essentially the power behind a government or at least, um, you know, if if it's a Disney movie, he's uh, – who are – I forget all the main like Jafar type characters. But the, the counselor that sits next to the king that whispers uh, dark things into the king or queen's ear. I mean that's essentially – that's that's really whittling it down but that's – a lot of what he ends up doing, whispering to to other people in power who make the decisions. I, I think when you when you have that position, you are going to be at least targeted by people who see conspiracies, if not actually taking part in conspiracies. Absolutely, well well said and well put. So, as as you mentioned, this is due to his membership in these enormously influential bodies. He's a member of the Bohemian Grove, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a member of the Bilderberg Group, a member of the Aspen Institute, a participant in the Trilateral Commission. We have episodes on pretty much all of those, except I believe the Aspen Institute. We also need to mention that the racist and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories come into play here too. They harp on Kissinger due to his Jewish background and then you'll, you'll read you know, the, these sorts of things saying that he is a key player in some sort of secretive Jewish cabal. This gets tied into those allegations of international banking cartels and so on. But while the Jewish conspiracy claptrap has been thoroughly and thankfully debunked, there is bad news here. The bad news is that banking cartel conspiracies do have sand. Some of them are very, very, very true. And it is highly likely that Henry Kissinger ran into something like banking-led conspiracies during his career. I mean, he did want to be an accountant. Oh, wow. (laughs) I didn't even think about that. (laughs) I didn't think we would have one that goes into uh, one that hinges on his accounting past. I mean, I (laughs) don't know. That's a very good point, Matt. Uh, So he he has been both a participant in genuine conspiracies and subject to Uh, speculation on other conspiracy theories, right? And for a lot of people, the big question is, at what point do these policies become war crimes? The conspiracies that he created and enacted, at what point do they go beyond um, being secretive for the purpose of national security and become something that you should prosecute someone for? And what really is the difference between those two things? Right. Where is the line? Where is the line? There's a guy named Mario Del Perro, a professor of international history and author of the eccentric realist Henry Kissinger and the Shaping of American Foreign Policy. 
he he reacts in in a different way. He throws a little wa- uh, little cold water on this. He says, "I am afraid that by the standards some of his critics have applied to Kissinger, numerous post nineteen forty five U.S. statesmen could be accused of crimes against humanity." And that applies perhaps to the vast majority of the leaders of modern great powers. Very good point, right? Uh, Like at some point, if you're in charge of a country, are you responsible for every bad thing that country does? Oh, gosh, it's true. That's kind of a tough truth. I guess we have to face a little bit here. Right. Absolutely. We have to face it head on. Let's also let's also continue just a little bit because. Del Perro doesn't believe that Henry Kissinger was very good at his job, to be honest. He says he's not some sort of arch manipulator. He says Kissinger was simplistic, binary, even uninformed during his tenure. He was dogmatic. He adhered to the zero-sum game of international politics. And then Del Perro says, in short, he wasn't a war criminal. He wasn't a very deep or sophisticated thinker. He rarely challenged the intellectual vogues or fads of the time. And once in government, he displayed a certain intellectual laziness. Wow. That's interesting. That's an interesting take, right? That's saying, that's saying look, the, the argument here is almost like if he's a war criminal, everyone else is. And also – the hype's not real. He wasn't that good at what he did. Yeah, he wasn't as big a part of any of this. It's I, – I wonder about the motivation there because it's certainly not a view that is – or it's not a view of Kissinger that you see very often, mm-hmm. right? He, again, like we kind of laid it out at the top there. He's a lot of times seen as this war criminal or, you know, a hero and just being a lazy government guy that's just sitting around not doing much, being uninformed. Yeah, you don't hear that very often. I I was thinking about the 2016 Democratic debates. Just really quick aside here. Yeah, yeah. Um, It was when – oh, I hope I'm not getting this wrong. I believe it was Hillary Clinton and – at least it was a discussion between the moderator, Hillary Clinton, and Bernie Sanders. And they were discussing Henry Kissinger. Okay. And uh, Hillary Clinton was a supporter of Kissinger. And at some point it's brought up that, yes, I she said, uh, uh, yes, I'll take the advice essentially or the counsel of Henry Kissinger. I, you know, I believe him to – be very informed and, uh, you know, I, his opinion I value essentially. Mm-hmm. And then Bernie Sanders said the opposite, like, no, absolutely. And laid out some of the war crimes things, at least in very, very brief ways and just said, no, I absolutely won't take advice from this person. And they had an, a really fairly, fairly brief, but interesting exchange about him on the stage uh, at a debate like that. Yeah, Kissinger is seen as um, a, a tutor of yeah. Hillary Clinton. Yeah, which I, I think would surprise some people who are more on the conservative side. Yeah, because you know you associate politics suffers from that false dichotomy here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people would say, okay, this guy did a bunch of stuff under the Richard Nixon administration. So why is he advising, why is he a counselor to Hillary Clinton? And this is a point where, you know, you have to ask yourself, fingers on a hand, right? Yeah. Well, and and Hillary Clinton also makes a very rational point here, which is this, this man has such a wealth of experience in dealing with foreign powers as well as the United States as a power why would you not listen to him just mm-hmm. from an experience perspective? I mean, that does seem like a rational point. The question then becomes one of not just experience, but of uh, accomplishment, success, or lack thereof. Uh, sure, and alignment. And like, like, are you going to align yourselves with that kind of power, I guess, um, if you're running for something like the mm-hmm. office for president? Anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. Sure. Right now, Regardless, again, of what we may or may not think about Henry Kissinger as individuals, judges from Argentina, Chile, France, and Spain are still seeking his testimony regarding crimes committed by U.S. client regimes in South America in the 1970s, those uh, U.S.-backed dictatorships we mentioned earlier. 
When he was in London in April of 2001, uh, British activists sought his arrest on charges related to the Vietnam War. Even in the U.S., he was the subject of a civil suit bought by the family of a Chilean military chief murdered in the 70s as part of the U.S. attempt to block the election of Salvador Allende. Now, some people doubtlessly see the criticism of Henry Kissinger as unfounded or even offensive. And calling someone a war criminal is a very heavy charge. It's a term that's actually rarely used today in political discourse because calling someone a war criminal automatically implies that they have killed massive amounts of people through either their direct actions or their policy decisions. Well, yeah, because then it becomes an argument of is that a war crime? Even though they killed all these people, is that a war crime? Did they do it in a way that would constitute that? Right, exactly. And we have tons of international law on that very subject. However, it is true that Kissinger simply cannot travel to certain countries for fear of arrest. And this is also something in which he is not unique amongst various, uh, various former politicians and bureaucrats. As we record today's episode, Henry Kissinger is alive. He is 97 years old. He will likely never be prosecuted for his actions. Uh, and some argue that he should not be as the U.S. is historically opposed to any sort of international legal action against serving or former U.S. politicians. This is where this is where something called the American Service Members Protection Act of 2002 comes into play. It essentially – it's a law that might be hilarious or terrifying to some of us listening outside of the U.S. It's a law in the United States – that authorizes the use of military force to liberate any American or citizen of a U.S. allied country being held in the International Criminal Court that's located in The Hague. This has been called the Hague Invasion Clause. People in Europe, particularly in the Netherlands, obviously, hate this idea. The law provides for the withdrawal of U.S. military assistance from countries that agree with the ICC treaty. It restricts U.S. participation in U.N. peacekeeping unless the U.S. is immune from prosecution. So – and and there's a provision that says the president can change his or her mind on this whenever due to national interest. Wow. So, wow. So if, for instance, uh, Paul's dodgy international past catches up with him – and he is he is arrested and taken to the International Criminal Court. The U.S. has law in the books that says this country can send an invasion force to physically rescue him and extricate him from Europe. Wow. Well, Paul, whatever you did, um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's um, – uh, a much more three-dimensional thing that occurred. There are reasons behind it, the reasons you did it. But, you know, in the end, we're going to get you back, buddy. And that also is a terrible example because Paul is a hero. He is. And he is a, uh, known as a gem mm -hmm. domestically and abroad. But one thing is for sure. Henry Kissinger did conspire to do numerous things that were at the very, very least unethical, dirty pool. He actively, provably created and participated in a number of conspiracies to advance what he saw as the greater good for the U.S. on a global stage. That is true. It's not a theory. That's not a person's opinion. That is a fact. The big question is, was it all worth it? Hmm. Well, we, we're we going to, I guess, figure that out in the next hundred years, um, just really looking back at it, I think. And generally when someone passes, I think the, the harsh realities of a person's life can be viewed, I guess, more fully at least by, mm -hmm. by society, by history, and we can actually talk about it in a way that we couldn't when they were still living. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have a feeling – you know, unfortunately for Henry Kissinger, probably pretty soon he, he won't be with us and maybe we'll get a little more light shed on exactly what happened. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Or it'll go to the grave with him, maybe. Or it will go to the grave. We want to know what you think. Is it true that these sorts of things occur and do serve a greater good? Or is that – 
an oversimplification. You know what I mean? Uh, was Kissinger making the best, if harsh, political decisions for the time, or was he blinded by uh, ideology or something else? Let us know. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. We especially enjoy shouting out Here's Where It Gets Crazy, which is run by some of the best mods in the business. Uh, We also, by the way, owe someone a happy birthday. Pretty (gasps) belated, but happy birthday, cat. Happy birthday, cat. Happy birthday, Kat. Your birthday was a was a little while ago, uh, but yeah. we 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 got around to getting the shout out there. Sort of better late than never. Yes, happy birthday to you, Kat. And if you want to call in, you might get on the show if you have a suggestion, anything you want to tell us, a comment about this episode or another, you can give us a call. We are one eight three three S T D W Y T K. You got three minutes. You'll hear Ben. You'll feel safe. Uh, oh, well, maybe. Maybe you'll feel safe. On the, I don't know. It's a, little, it's a little creepy, but it's just the way we roll here. That's just, that's just the way we roll. And if you do not care for phones, if you are averse to social media, but you still have some insight, something to weigh in on, or a suggestion for a topic you believe your fellow listeners will enjoy, we'd still love to hear from you. We have good news. You can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.